Let's now start talk about a stakeholder analysis. Now, this sounds really complicated, but it's not. And I would say that this is one of the most vital templates or um, processes that you want to go through, regardless of what project you're running or the scale of it. To the extent to which you apply this template will depend again on the scale of the project, but to some degree you want to have identified who your stakeholders are. The first step of this is listing all of your stakeholders down. And you already started to do that process as part of the project canvas. Let me clarify what a stakeholder is. Stakeholders are anyone who has even the slightest bit of interest or influence on your project. That interest or influence, as I mentioned before, does not necessarily mean they are supportive, but they are regardless, even those who might be challenging the project, they are still stakeholders because it is likely you are going to have to manage these people to some degree. I have found from my experience of working in project management for over a decade, a big killer of projects is a lack of stakeholder management or consideration to their preferred communication style, how much information they would like to receive. This can ultimately, I, I sometimes say to people that you will soon find your stakeholders out when you're getting all of those complaints through. So let's have a look at the process for analyzing our stakeholder groups. Let me just share the template with you now. So going back to our project management workbook, you first want to identify all of your stakeholders. So you want this to be an exhaustive list of everyone you can think of. So as a starting point, I was using uh, a workshop that I recently did as an example, so a stakeholder would be me, organizer. I wouldn't need to manage myself, but I've just put it down there. The participants, the venue, potential future participants, potential future funders, other potential local venues, and there could be many more. And who your stakeholders are and who you determine them to be is ultimately up to you as the project owner, the project manager. Some people might list um, cleaning staff, catering staff. I've used, I, I've just opted for venue uh, as, a, as an umbrella group under all of that, but you may detail them in, in, in particular um, as individuals. In the same way, you might have separate partners. They might be organizations or they could be individuals. So they could be champions of your project and you would name them by, by, by their name. Whatever makes sense for you and the project that you're working on, you do what makes sense. What we then want to do is essentially, we're looking at this stakeholder matrix here. And what we essentially want to do is we want to assess the level of, I suppose, importance of each stakeholder. Because by doing that, we can determine how to manage each stakeholder individual or group and to what degree because we don't wanna manage all of the stakeholders in exactly the same way. We don't have enough resources for that. It's unnecessary. There are some stakeholders who are gonna be more important than others. There's some stakeholders who are gonna need a different type of managing or communication than others. And we'll go through some examples in a moment. Essentially, this matrix helps us to sort out those stakeholders. So it's a very simple matrix here, where on this axis, you can see here, you have the influence or otherwise known as the power of the stakeholder. So you have low power down here or low influence and then high influence up here. So essentially you would determine, does this stakeholder have low influence over my project or do they have a high influence? And by influence or power, we mean to what degree does this person or this group of stakeholders, to what degree do they have the ability to positively or negatively impact the project? Are they a funder? And so if they retract their funding, that's a huge, they have huge influence and power over the success of the project. If they are the venue and they essentially pull the space, they have huge power and influence over whether that, that project will be delivered or not. So 
Whether they're high or low influence is up to you. It will be different for different people, different types of relationships. So you need to determine this for yourself. And this isn't a science. It doesn't have to be exact. Just have a feel for it. Okay. So let's move on to this axis here. This axis is the interest of the stakeholder. So here we were looking at influence and power. And then on this axis, it's the interest of the stakeholder. How interested are they in the project? It's either low interest or high interest. To what extent is the stakeholder invested in your project? Whether that's from the point of view that they're supportive of it, um, whether they, um, they know about it, to what extent does this project interest them? How much, how much information do you think they're going to want because of their interest in the project? And by plotting our stakeholders, we're then able to determine who is of low influence or low interest and who is of high influence and high interest. And the benefit of doing that is that we then understand how to manage each of the stakeholders. So let's take each box. So let's start with low, low influence and low power and low interest. These stakeholders, we want to provide with sort of minimal communication, right? We What we term monitor, minimal effort. They have low influence and power in the project and they have low interest in the project. And then we have low interest, but high power. So these people, they're not, this isn't a passion project of theirs. They're not particularly interested in maybe the subject area, but they do have high power and high influence over the success of the project. Then let's move on to high interest, but low power. So there may be stakeholders who have a high interest in the project, like the topic or the subject area, or um, it's because it directly relates to their lived experience. They have a high interest in the project, but they have very low power or influence as to the success of it. These people, we want to keep these stakeholders adequately informed, talk to them to ensure that no major issues arise. We just want to keep them informed. And then we have high interest and high influence. So these manage closely, right? These are the stakeholders you must engage and make the greatest efforts with. They have high interest and they have high power. So let's take, for example, one of my stakeholders, the venue. Now, the venue for my project was very, very important because for several reasons, they held the marketing database um, so they had already had a marketing pool of local people that I was tapping into in order to market this workshop to. They also provided the space for free to run this workshop, which I would not have been able to afford otherwise. So their influence and power over the project was quite high. It may not be the case for yours. You know, the, the venue may just be provided or you could you could have multiple venues or you already own the venue, in which case, it wouldn't be uh, the case for your project. However, for mine, they had high influence, high power. They had very low interest in the project. Whether the project happened or not was not of any great interest to them. They they did it as a favor um, because I, I know them quite well. However, they have very li limited interest in the project. Whether it happened or not, it didn't impact them. And so they have low interest so they would be in one of these boxes, but they also had high power and influence. So I placed the venue in my stakeholder analysis in this box here. And some people may plot people in different sort of areas within this box, depending on how high or low they are uh, within the box. That's up to you. I simply just list them in here. And then I know, based on the descriptors here, to what extent I need to manage each stakeholder group. So for example, I've put participants in high interest and high influence and power. The reason I put participants in there, for one, I would hope that they have a high interest in 
the content of the the project right the workshop that's essentially i've built it for them so they have high interest they also have high influence and power because the word of mouth from the participants is was going to be quite a powerful um tool for me to use or not um so their feedback will determine the success of uh, or, the, or the likelihood of of us being able to continue to do workshops so they have high power and high interest. So the other thing I wanted to show you, and, and what you would do before I just move on, you would plot all of your stakeholders, and then you have an idea of to what extent you, you can manage each of those. Now, the other useful tool is to think of each of your stakeholders. And what I would do is I would probably only do the stakeholder empathy map for those people who sat in my high influence and high interest. It all depends on the project. It all depends on to what degree you have to manage some of the stakeholders. You know, uh, maybe a very challenging stakeholder, regardless of which box they're in, you might want to run through this. And this is useful to help you to think about issues from the perspective of your stakeholders. So you can mitigate potential issues or complaints and manage them effectively um, as as a, a, a before it becomes a problem. Yeah. So once you've mapped out your stakeholders, you've identified your stakeholder matrix matrix, I would definitely start with those stakeholders who are high influence and high interest to interest. And you would simply run each stakeholder group or individual through these questions to get a better understanding of them. So try completing the below empathy map from the perspective of some of the stakeholders. And you would write who they are um, on the top here. And you would run through these questions for each stakeholder group. What do they think and feel? What really counts for them? What, um, What are their worries? What are their aspirations? What do you want and need? And by running through these questions, you don't have to answer each one. Just answer the ones that uh, are most relevant. But you begin to completely and utterly empathize with the, the the group or the individual you're you're talking to, and then you're able to manage that group or individual more effectively. If you spend time understanding them, you can then determine uh, uh, the most effective path and method for communicating to to them. Now, as I say, this is quite time consuming. I personally would only do it for those stakeholders who sit in my high influence and power and high interest. And I would begin to think of them through using these questions uh, in order to get a better understanding for myself and how best to approach communication with them. So the next tool that follows on quite nicely from the stakeholder analysis is the communication plan. The communication plan All the information that you gleaned from the stakeholder analysis, you would then use in order to identify how each stakeholder group needs to be communicated to and what needs to be communicated to them. So let me share the tool in the workbook here. Here is an example of a communication plan. So again, you want to have done your stakeholder analysis first in order to know, in order to start thinking about who you need to communicate to. Um, Now, there's nothing more important on a project than communicating, communicating, communicating. So the way this is a very, very simple tool, the way that we use this is simply you identify the method that you want to communicate to, who the receiver is, who the sender is, what the message is, and when it's going to be sent out. So for example, we've got the receiver of the receiver of um, the one stakeholder group are the potential participants. Um, and they can be found through you know my social media followers or the venue social media followers. And so the method in which we're taking is Insta stories. We're tagging Bromley as a location because that's the area in which we were focusing. 
and we were tagging. I should also put there tagging venue and J Stone Changes accounts. So we were tagging each other's accounts. Mostly the sender was me. So I was creating Instagram stories and then tagging the venue. Uh, the message essentially was who the workshop is for, what it will cover, benefits, how to sign up. You can put as much detail in there as you want, depending on what your project is. You might write out the message, if that makes sense for you. All I needed to know was top line, what things I wanted to talk about and when. And then on, on the day, I was able to just yeah write those as I was going. But depending on the, the scale and level of your project and, and the level of planning you like to do, you might write out those uh, those messages in full. And then when was uh, I knew that I wanted to put out one Instagram story per week. Again, in a similar way, for those participants who were signed up, um, they would get an email, the sender would be me, it'd be a preparation email ahead of the event, it would have the event time and date location, how to log in to find their tickets, what to do on arrival, and that would be sent two days before the workshop. So I would go through my stakeholder analysis, making sure that I've I've identified all of the stakeholders involved um, either interested or having influence on the project and I would make sure that as part of this communication plan I have included them to some degree some may be as little as adding people to your monthly newsletter the newsletter list and they would get all of the communications through that means or it might simply be uh, you know it could be a face-to-face -face conversation with volunteers so you would have two days before the event you would have a volunteer sort of housekeeping meetup uh, to discuss roles and so on. So whatever method of communication is most appropriate for each group, you would analyze using the stakeholder analysis and then add it into the communication plan. Brilliant. So now what I suggest is or invite you to do is go back to the stakeholder analysis and the comms plan and run your practice project through the templates. And once you've completed those, move on to the next video.